Welcome to you today. I'm Steve Shankman, director of the Oregon Humanities Center. We're speaking today with Brian Turner, a poet and guest of the Creative Writing Program, who will be reading his work on campus. Brian Turner earned his BA at California State University, Fresno, and his MFA right here at the University of Oregon. His book of poems, Here Bullet, has been critically acclaimed. It's won the 2006 Maine Literacy Award in Poetry, the 2005 Beatrice Hawley Award, the New York Times Editor, Editor's Choice Selection, and the Northern California Book Award. Here Bullet is a first-person account of the Iraq War based on Turner's experiences as a soldier. Brian Turner has been an English instructor and a construction worker. He lived in South Korea for a year before serving in the Army for seven years with stints in both Bosnia-Herzegovina with the 10th Mountain Division and in Iraq with the 3rd Striker Brigade, Brig Brigade Combat Team. In the last year and a half, he has been interviewed widely, invited to read from his work Coast to Coast, and seen his poetry adopted for courses offered at West Point and Annapolis and at universities throughout the country. Welcome. Thank you. Thank it's, you great. It's, it's great to have you here. I've, I've read your book very recently, and uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a, a stunning, very interesting book, so I'm looking forward to talking with you about it. Thank you. Now, this book here, Bullet, is frequently referred to as your debut, a de it is your debut, but in reality, you've been writing poetry for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, tell me about how this book came about in relation to what you were doing before. Uh, well, I started writing poetry in my late teens, into early 20s, and I wrote as well as a machinist, and then later when I came here to the University of Oregon, I studied uh, poetry when I was just before 30. And then I, did, I joined the military, I was in for seven years, but during that span, from completing the degree here at the University of Oregon to uh, the publication of this book, I'd written seven other manuscripts mm. uh, on a wide variety of topics. Well, tell me about some of the topics that you've written uh, about before. One book was on a, a book about intimacy was a the theme. Another was about invention. Another uh, was about South Korea. Um, another was uh, about a failed marriage. Another, the, the last one, the one before um, this one was when I was in Bosnia, I wrote one called In the Bullet Factory. And I learned a lot while being deployed in Bosnia about research and writing about the historical uh, content or material that seemed to crop up when I was there. Mm -hmm. And I and informed the poems that I was writing. And doing that process, sort of researching in country while doing missions, uh, I think laid the groundwork that helped me to write this book. Mm -hmm. um. And, and so what other, how, how did you mm. get the idea of writing this particular book? When did it, when did it mm. uh, strike you? Oh, as a book, I didn't realize I had a book exactly until I came back, the month I came back. Mm -hmm. uh, that's when I collected all the poems together and tried to see some type of, of a whole or a cohesion. Um, when I was there, I think the poems mirror sort of the experience I felt in that um, there were poems that fe I felt like I had to write. Because this feels overly dramatic now, but at the time, today's uh, what, Thursday. Mm -hmm. Well, a Thursday in Iraq, a soldier you don't know, you know, is Tuesday going to come? So uh, as a poet also, um, what poem am I going to write today before that Tuesday comes, you know? So I was writing along those lines, writing so poems. One, sort of one day at a time yeah, kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. Uh -huh. and, uh, and, and one poem at a time. Yeah. Mostly there were journal entries. I had these journals, and I'd write uh, in my journals mostly uh, sort of recapping the, the day's events. Uh, maybe a situation came up, and I would draw diagrams of the event, where people were, what had happened, sort mm -hmm. of wargaming what had happened. So if something similar came up later, I might be able to react better. And also to sort of uh, journal and remember what had happened. Uh, as I'd fill these up, I'd send them back home. Mm -hmm. Sometimes a few lines of poems would come out or an entire poem would develop from, from that journal entry. So when, mm -hmm. when did, so it didn't strike you until after you'd come back that it's, in fact you had a book here? Uh, not, not part of your to, consciousness? It's hard to recall. It really wasn't, um, like making a book really wasn't sort of on my, uh -huh. um, my thinking. Because I really just wanted to get home. Right. But, uh, but I had been sending a few of the poems back home. A couple of them had been published mm -hmm. when I was, in, not, sort of unintentionally, because I was sending them to someone because he'd asked for them to see what I was writing, and then he published them. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's a really nice gesture, but, uh, um, yeah. Did your uh, comrades uh, in arms know that you were writing poems? 
No, they didn't. Uh -huh. uh, I didn't share that. And uh, a lot of people sometimes wonder about that. And I, I can understand, but uh, I, I felt that a lot of the soldiers that I worked with wouldn't take the time to sit down with the poems and see what they're about. Because I, I think, and I, and I found since found out that, uh, that they would find them interesting and find them accessible and mm -hmm. something that they could get into, mm -hmm. not what they think perhaps what the word poetry mean, meant to them before. But uh, while I was there, I, I was Sergeant Turner, and it felt to me it was important to me to have that sort of veneer or that, that uh, persona so that people would trust me that I was going to go into the door because I was a team leader, and team leaders lead from the front in my unit. Mm -hmm. So that means I have to go in the door first. And I, had, I wanted to make sure that the guys following me in had trust in me that I would, I would do what I had to do. So why yeah. would the fact that you were a poet somehow mm -hmm. uh, tarnish your image or complicate the situation? What, what, um, was, your, what, was, your, what was your thinking? That, that you might have mm -hmm. ulterior motives about why you were there? Or? Yeah, I think it was more along the lines that it uh, it's, can be seen by some as sort of a flowery art. I know? see. And that the domain of poetry a lot of times is limited in the public, in the larger pro public perception as being a certain type of poem about a flower, a tree, mm -hmm. very sensitive, very you know emotional, mm -hmm. things like that. Not um, hard nosed and tough and and uh, difficult, mm -hmm. which of course is also the domain of poetry. Mm -hmm. You know, and, yeah. and from what I found, that's really the domain of, of poetry is finding out those difficult things in life. Mm -hmm. How do we deal with them? Mm -hmm. you know? So tell me about um, your own models. I mean, did you were, were you thinking of any you know war 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 poets when you were writing these? Mm. You know, I wasn't specifically thinking them in my mind as I was writing the poems, but I know deep down uh, some of the things I'd done here at the University of Oregon and, and prior to that, some of that study had uh, sort of sunk its roots in, in the sense that uh, Bruce Weigel, Yusef Kumanyaka, um, Wilfred Owen, Rupert Brooks, yeah. uh, Walt Whitman was care for the wounded and, mm -hmm. and you know, the hospital poems and things. Um, some of those things were like really deeply rooted. So. Uh, they ha there has to be echoes, I would think, you know, if you look at my work. So, let's see, you entered uh, the service, I think it was 1998? Is I did. that right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, February of 98. And that was uh, long before September 11th. It was long mm -hmm. before uh, Iraq. Uh, if you don't mm -hmm. mind sharing with us, what, what mm -hmm. compelled you to, uh, mm -hmm. uh, to serve your country in that way? Um, there are quite a few reasons, because it's one of those difficult decisions in life, and oftentimes I found that those include a wide variety of, and there's one reason that I hope you'll understand I respectfully uh, keep to myself, and I don't Absolutely. Really share. But there are other parts that, um, that definitely uh, fed into the, the thinking process. For example, my, my father had been uh, in, actively in the Cold War with the U.S. Army, uh, flying over Russian airspace and things like that. Um, my grandfather had been a, a Marine infantryman in World War II and had pretty much served in most of the major battles of, of the Pacific Theater. Guadalcanal, Iwo Jima, you know, things like that. And um, so I'd, I'd been raised sort of in a military family, military tradition. And also there were a lot of practical things that helped out. Uh, I paid back my college. I had some loans from when I was here. And um, they really helped me out by paying those, paying those loans down. Mm -hmm. um, sort of set me up for a while when I came back from overseas and didn't have a lot of things. So it's very helpful in a practical way. Uh, before we go, before we go any further, I was wondering mm. just to introduce our audience if they if they haven't sure, experienced sure. your work. Mm. Uh, would you mind reading for us the uh, the the poem that gives the collection its uh, its title? Absolutely. Uh, here, here, bullet. Sure. Should I read it into the camera or something? I don't uh, know. Or just sure, to read just it to, to you? Just to read it know. to me is fine. Okay. Mm -hmm. Here, bullet. If a body is what you want, then here is bone and gristle and flesh. Here is the clavicle-snapped wish, the aorta's open valves, the leap thought makes at the synaptic gap. Here is the adrenaline rush you crave, that inexorable flight, that insane puncture into heat and blood. And I dare you to finish what you've started, because here, bullet, here is where I complete the word you bring hissing through the air. Here is where I moan the barrel's cold esophagus, triggering my tongue's explosives for the rifling I have inside of me. Each twist of the round spun deeper, because here, bullet, here is where the world ends every time. That's a, 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 a powerful, a powerful poem. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, here is where I moan the barrel's cold esophagus triggering my tongue's explosives for the rifling I have inside of me. Mm. 
So for you, is it fair to mm. say that, that, that poetry was mm. your weapon in, 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 in some way to, to, mm. to, uh, 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 to yeah, deal yeah. With, with the bullets that are, that are coming at you that you have, in a uh, sense, no control over? It, it seems for me that poem, yeah, I believe so, and I think it does sort of two things for me personally. One is sort of it, it internalizes and sort of creates this the weapon inside, you mm -hmm. know, and the, uh, the a recognition of the fear of death, um, patrolling through the streets of Mosul or Baghdad or something, um, knowing that somewhere out in the darkness there could be a rifle and someone about to pull a trigger at that moment and a bullet for me, you know. Um, and at the same time, in the sense that you were saying, it sort of felt like a taunt towards death because to be haunted and sort of sort of hunted by death, even if invisibly, uh, for so long, a few months, it starts to accumulate as you're, as you're there for a year. Um, I, I felt like at some point I was like, well, I, okay, let me learn what this is about. You know, one part of me felt like that. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's sort of the territory that that poem is, is going towards. Mm -hmm. And w one thing that's interesting to me about this poem is I never really fully understand this poem. Uh, you yourself? No, I don't. Uh, uh -huh. It's very, so I think it's so internal. It's very hard for me to understand exactly. I, in fa it's very odd. I, I wrote that poem in about 15 minutes. It's the only poem that I wrote this quickly, 12 to 15 minutes. And uh, there were three other lines that I scratched out at the time. And that's verbatim the way I wrote it wow. then in February. Yeah. And I folded up, put it in a Ziploc bag, and I put it in my chest pocket. And I wore it the rest of the time I was in Iraq. Mm -hmm. so, oh, so you actually wore, wore this poem with yeah, you. So yeah. in that sense, it was almost like a... Yeah, sort of a shield a and shield. sort of a taunt. Uh huh. You know? A taunt. Yeah. yeah. At the same it, time, it reminds me. Yeah. I, you probably weren't thinking about this, but mm. I, you know, in the in the in Homer's Iliad, the way that the, mm. the, the, the the warriors will will actually taunt. They will <laughs> taunt their right. their their a adversaries with mm. very powerful rhetoric as somehow mm. some way to to deal with this uh, mm. inexplicable inexplicably powerful thing that's coming at them that they, mm. in a sense, have no control of. So here bullet why would you want uh, mm. is that giving you some kind of control like okay at least mm. I'm going to face this I'm going to face this thing rather than just have it sort of come mm. out of the blue come come get me here here I am yeah, maybe along to those deal lines. with the yeah. anxiety of not knowing when especially in an mm. environment like Iraq when mm. when you might be right that, that's a difficult thing in Iraq because uh, it is sort of a guerrilla warfare or it's a there's no front line, mm -hmm. so you don't know, as you said, you don't know when it's going to happen. But an infantry soldier, we're trained to be, um, our mission, the mission of the infantry is to close with and destroy the enemy. Not to like capture them, not to stop them from what they're doing, but to uh -huh. close with and destroy the enemy. Uh -huh. And to be the last like 300 meters on the ground. Mm -hmm. So um, when you get trained to do that, then it's, uh, and you go out there and you're trying to stop the war by finishing it once and for all. It's very frustrating day after day, not not making contact, but having mortars come in on camp. Someone's still trying to kill you indirectly, mm -hmm. but you can never confront the person who's killing you mm -hmm. or trying to kill you. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, now these mm -hmm. poems, uh, one of the things one is struck by is how vivid they are. Uh, you're, you're there, they're very mm -hmm. non-political, completely, they seem mm -hmm. almost completely apolitical. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Render, well, yeah, I, I would say uh, maybe not completely, but mm. I'd say pretty much they're really not dealing with the, the question of is our being there the right or the not or or, or mm. the wrong thing to do. So is that mm. is that kind of a strategy on on your part? Overall, or is it, it, yeah, yeah. I, I think once I came back and I put the collection together because I did with an editor uh, April Osman and some other people, uh, Dorian Lux here, in fact, too. Mm -hmm. um, we did some some work in the editing stages where we stripped away a little bit of commentary that uh, that might have sort of pushed people away from the work. And because? Because I wanted... I no, no, want no, 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 no. Uh, oh. I mean, I'm sorry. The yeah. poems would have pushed them away because because they were taking a p uh, some sort of stance. More of a stance. There uh -huh. were some quotes from different people that uh, I, I realized that those might push people away who I most wanted to invite in. Uh -huh. and, uh, and at the same time, I th I'm happy overall because one of the, the rules that I sort of try to live by as a writer is to... Uh, I, I believe it's William Stafford who said this. I could be wrong, but it's, uh, so I'm, I'm sorry if it's a wrong quote, but mm -hmm. basically the quote is that uh, the job of a writer is not to pose the, the answers or the solutions to the problem, but the job of a writer is to write the questions more clearly. Mm -hmm. So I was hoping, because I knew that people here in America, I knew this when I was writing the poems. I didn't know overall if this would be a book, but I knew individually 
that these poems would in, add and inform in an evocative way, in an emotional, emotionally charged way, um, which is d another domain of poetry. Um, it would add to the dialogue back home uh, what was missing in newspaper accounts that are still crucial in their own way, but uh, we, we watch CNN or the BBC, we see a photo maybe, or we read about a bomb, mortar attack or something, some, that emotional, the humanity, the loss, the love, those kinds but of things. It's not there. It, it, it's not part of what they do, you know. And, uh, but it's necessary for us to feel that back home when we make our decisions overall. That's, that's, that's very well said. Along those lines, I wonder if you would read for us 16 sure. Iraqi hmm. policemen, which I think hmm. goes to some of the issues you've just been Yeah, I, I remember uh, running about. through the rubble of a, of a car bomb that had gone off and running through that to set up security on the far side with my fire team. And uh, this poem came from this afterwards. Mm -hmm. uh, 16 Iraqi policemen. The explosion left a hole in the roadbed large enough to fit a mid-sized car. It shattered concrete, twisted metal, busted storefront windows and sheets, and lifted a BMW, BMW chassis up onto a rooftop. The shocking blood of the men forms an obscene art. A mustache alone on a sidewalk, a blistered hand's gold ring still shining, while a medic, Doc Lopez, pauses to catch his breath, to blow it out hard, so he might cup the left side of a girl's face in one hand gently before bandaging the half gone missing. Allah must wander in the crowd as I do, dazed by the pure concussion of the blast among sirens, voices of the injured, the boots of running soldiers, not knowing whom to touch first, for the dead policeman cannot be found, here a moment before, then vanished. Well, that's very powerful. It's not, not the kind of thing we, mm. we hear about in the, in the news, mm. is it? Yeah, because a blistered ring still shining. Yeah, and uh, the mustache is uh, right? yeah. very powerful. Yeah, the blistered yeah. ring still shining. Because yeah. mm -hmm. you, know, you realize, wow, there's a family. There's, there's love there. That was a commitment to a marriage. You know? mm -hmm. was, mm -hmm. But now torn asunder and the pieces and destroyed completely. You know? So mm. Allah's wondering in this mm. crowd, maybe. Hmm. Maybe he's not even there, but right. that, yeah. uh, <laughs> <laughs> why, why, is, why is Allah wandering? Well, I it thought about having other, like God or some other, yes, another too, uh -huh. but I, I felt like to do a service, I was, in, I was in their land. Right. And this is the land of Allah, mostly, predominantly. Yes. So I, I felt I had to wander with, with who was there in right. that land. Yeah, Among and that's people. one of the powerful things about mm. your, your book is you do, mm. you get into the history of the, of the region, mm. you try to enter into that, into, into the experience of the place that you're, that you're in. Mm -hmm. um, was that mm. widely shared by your, uh, by your, your fellow soldiers, that, mm. that interest, that, that uh, awareness that you're in a, a place that's very different from home? I think uh, yes and no, probably. Uh -huh. I mean, it's hard for me to speak for others, but uh, just at a, from my own glance across the unit that I was in, uh, it seemed like there were quite a few soldiers who were fascinated by where we were, too. You know, it was a very difficult situation to be there. You hear a lot of people, all they wanted to do was go home. Almost everybody just wanted to go home, but at the same time, it was hard not to uh, be interested by some of the passing Babylon and Sumer. Um, I remember walking out in the snow flats, it snowed at one point. In the middle of Mosul, a city of about 1.2 million, there's a, a park there that's a sort of a central park, Golden Gate Park-sized park. It's mostly barren. Uh, the perimeter of the park has these low hills and a road around it, so when you drive, you can't actually see in because the hills are too high. But uh, once we walked out over them about two, three in the morning in the snow, at nighttime with the night vision goggles on so we could see with the light reflected off the snow, um, and I'm doing my job. I was on point. I was a point man at the time. So I'm walking. We were in these wedges. So I'd, I'd turn around in slow circles every now and then, see where everyone was behind me, um, get a thumbs up with my squad leader, doing my job, thinking about wind direction, dogs that might bark and give away our position, things like that. But at the same time, I'm realizing, wow, you know, th this, where I was, was, were the ruins of Nineveh. And I could be walking right where the tablets of Gilgamesh were unearthed, you know. Mm -hmm. There are many different translations right here in the, the night library, 
and uh, Herbert Mason's my favorite one. I'd read it right out of high school, mm -hmm. and then again in college, different versions and stuff. But uh, to know that I was where, you know, the Sumerians, the Babylonians, the deep culture uh, existed there, and there was much to learn from the land you know, and the people. But, but again, yeah. did you feel that mm. this was a common, I mean, again, you say um, you, can't, you can't really uh, can't speak really say, for other people. Yeah, well, you know, a lot of us soldiers, we would share some of these stories, uh -huh. and I would hear their stories, and they'd hear mine. It seemed like we were all trying to soak in um, as much as we could. Uh -huh. Some of the language, we tried to learn some. Um, it's, uh, and then, of course, there were some soldiers who didn't seem to care less. They wanted to do their own thing. It, sort of like American society. It's a wide right. swath of people who are, you know, wide variety of people who joined the military, mm -hmm. which kind of surprised me when I joined. I had a sort of stereotypical idea of who was in the military, and that was kind of broken down when I was in. Mm -hmm. um, just wide variety of people. And mostly I, f I find it's for socioeconomic reasons um, why people end up in the military. And uh, you find a lot of people different... Uh, it's a wide palette. Mm -hmm. yes. yeah. Yeah. You want to read us uh, uh, one more poem. This is a, a soldier's Arabic because we've been sure. talking about mm -hmm. how uh, one of the unusual things about this uh, mm -hmm. collection mm -hmm. is that you're, you know, you, you talk about it, you use Arabic words, you, you go to historical mm -hmm. sites, you, you seem to be trying to get inside mm -hmm. the culture or you seem to have been turned inside out by the culture and by mm -hmm. the experience that, that, you're, mm -hmm. that you've undergone mm -hmm. or undergoing. Mm -hmm. uh, sure. Uh, yeah, and, and I, I feel like, uh, unfortunately, I was only able to sort of scratch at the, that surface, you know. Mm -hmm. I wish I could have learned much more. But under the circumstances... Yeah, we were, you were doing it, very well. Yeah, it was, it was tough. Mm -hmm. So uh, This poem starts with a Hemingway quote, which says, uh, This is a strange new kind of war where you learn just as much as you are able to believe. A soldier's Arabic. The word for love, Habib, is written from right to left, starting where we would end it, and ending where we might begin. Where we would end a war, another might take as a beginning, or as an echo of history recited again. Speak the word for death, mot, and you will hear the cursives of the wind driven into the veil of the unknown. This is a language made of blood. It is made of sand and time. To be spoken, it must be earned. Mm -hmm. Um, <clears throat> where we would end a war, another might take as a beginning mm. or as an echo of history recited again. Mm. Well, tell uh, me what you, yeah. I can understand the echo of history, mm -hmm. I guess that we're, the United States Army is involved in, in the Middle East again and, mm -hmm. or in, in some way, mm. but what's this about ending, ending and beginning? Uh, well, when the President of the United States stands on a ship and says, I see. You know? uh -huh. um, but that was really the beginning because we're, now the war's really started. As I, as I, I came see. in, I came in and we relieved the troops who were in the initial invasion. And uh, uh, we saw plenty of action and, and damage and, uh, inflicted on our unit and other units with us. And the unit that followed after us saw even more than we did. You know, this so is, this is in the in the initial uh, the, right. the initial yeah we came stages. in in, in uh, November to December of 2003. Uh -huh. So the invasion had already happened. So uh -huh. we came in several months later. We mm -hmm. ended up being the replacements for the initial invasion force. I see. And uh, and you thought it was over. No. When you went. No, I didn't. Uh -huh. but, uh, and I, I went in prepared, thinking that we were still going to have to deal with combat. And mm -hmm. what we found was that uh, uh, it's, a, it's a war of attrition at this point for who can be. Um, who casualties? I should back up. Casualties are being sustained when we went there. That I believe I don't know the numbers exactly that exceeded the group prior to us. And then the unit, the specific unit that replaced my unit, um, saw even more than action than we did. Mm -hmm. And that was you know second year into the war. And uh, so that idea of uh, where we might feel as an I ending see. another Iraqi insurgents or freedom fighters, whatever you want to call them, might find as a beginning. Uh -huh. You know, this is something that's getting started. And then as an echo of history, um, sometimes I ask my students, I teach in a junior college down in, in Fresno, and I remember sitting there with about 20 or 30 students and asking, okay, when was the last time we were in, in Iraq or dealing with Iraq or fighting with Iraq prior to 2003? And uh, it would be silence. And maybe one student in the back, uh, 1991, 92, like that, right? Well, it's such a short memory, um, you know. And... Uh, 
we had different dealings with during the Iran Iraq war as far as um, helping with advisors and uh, chemical weapons things like that uh, but let's just talk about imperialism in, in a way um, if I was an Iraqi uh, how, how do I get to this in 1991 there was a war but in 1948 it wasn't America but it was an ally it was Britain there was the Wat Ba uprising mm -hmm. you know, the bombing of a bridge by the British and stuff in in 1918 to 1925, pushing into 30 or so, there's a British protectorate in the northern part of Iraq, and, uh, and it goes further back. And mm -hmm. you know, 1925, 1918, my, my grandfather was born in 1924. So um, I, I know there's people born in 1924 that are alive in Iraq right now. Mm -hmm. So that's living, you know, verbal history that can be shared of all these, even just of, of these and couple of generations. People don't know it. Here. And they're not aware of it but, here. But they but know. There, they they, they do. remember. Yeah. Uh -huh. And this is passed down oral history that uh, it has to, at some point, start to show a pattern They're back to some again. people. Right. They're back again. Right. Mm -hmm. you know? And uh, that's the echo of history yes. in that poem. Yeah. 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 So um, do, do you think about, do you think about your, 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 your comrades I mean, or, or the or mm. people who are there now? I mean, every sure. day you're hearing things. There's just been... Mm. I don't know how many deaths yesterday. Uh, 16? I think it was eleven. I thought I heard. Eleven. They were reported, right? Right. Yeah. Uh, on our side, right? Exactly. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Um, do, do, do you do you follow it? I, I do, and also uh, some of the guys that are in my unit have that my unit's gone back. So a couple of them that worked under me, two of them that worked under me, are now um, they're transitioning out of the military. So I'm sort of keeping contact with them, but the ones that are back in there, there are two or three of them that I at, well, email. You know, mm -hmm. pretty much once a week or so. I've got a care package at home that I'm about to send them. So they went back in about two and a half, three weeks ago. So they've got a long year ahead of them. So mm -hmm. in the in the 30 seconds mm -hmm. or, or so, at what point does somebody who served mm -hmm. feel that he or she can can sort of say something of, of a political nature on one side or another as a moral mm -hmm. obligation? That because I guess you're very conflicted. On the one hand, mm -hmm. you 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 don't want to be dis disloyal mm -hmm. to the people, you know, you don't want to, mm -hmm. you don't want to make it more difficult for people to do their job. So what, mm -hmm. what, do you struggle with whether you should say mm -hmm. anything on one side or another to, uh, I do struggled you deal with, with it? I struggled with that more when I was there. Uh-huh. Because uh, I didn't believe in the mission when I was there, to uh -huh. be honest. Uh -huh. um, but I was a sergeant in charge of these soldiers and I, it was my job and like my duty to them. Yeah. And they're also my, my friends. Uh -huh. uh, to not lower their morale. To try right. to find some way to keep their morale up so they could live through that year and mm -hmm. make it and do what they whatever they had to do. Mm -hmm. So um, it was very hard for me, but I told them, I said, you know, we're here right now for the guy left and right of us, and that's why I ended yeah. up going. Yeah. But uh, for those, I, I told them when I came back that they, if I could, they would see me on, on television, they would see me in the news, anything I could do to try to uh, continue the dialogue and debate about what we're doing as a country in Iraq. Well, it's been absolutely fascinating speaking with you. I really appreciate your stopping by. Thank you. It's an honor. And we've been speaking with Brian Turner, the poet and author of the book, Hear Bullet. Thanks so much for joining us.